Your Excellency, Olaf Ragnar Grímsson, former president of Iceland, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pieter Ausgesson and I am the senior Arctic official of Iceland. Thank you all for joining us for this session dedicated to the report titled Greenland and Iceland in the New Arctic. The report was published by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Iceland in December last year. It was written by the Greenland Committee that was appointed by the Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Development Cooperation. We are honored to have with us today uh, to introduce and discuss the report, His Excellency Guðlaugur Thor Thórðarsson, Foreign Minister of Iceland, His Excellency Össur Skarpiansson, former minister, former Foreign Minister of Iceland, who served as the chairman of the Greenland report, and last but not least, Tove Sömdal Gant, head of the Greenlandic representation in Greenland, Tove kindly stepped in for Deputy Minister Mininwak Kleist of the Greenlandic Foreign Ministry, who unfortunately uh, had to cancel his trip at the last moment. I would like to ask and invite Minister Thorlason to make his opening remarks. Minister, the floor is yours. <coughs> Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Arctic Circle and its chairman, former president of Iceland, Olaf Ragnar Grimsson, for the great interest that the Greenland report receives, receives in this assembly. It is important to widely discuss the opportunities and recommendation in this report. It can only make our cooperation with our next door neighbor even stronger. The report has been received with interest. That was also my hope. However, I must admit that the reception has gone far beyond my expectations. The report contains detailed assessment of the country's bilateral relations and the status of the region in the new Arctic. The report finds that Iceland and Greenland have many common interests, including in the fishery sector, airline services, air traffic control, tourism, search and rescue, and Arctic affairs. In the coming years, increased cooperation in healthcare, education, and support services for the mining industry could become important areas of collaboration. Internationally, the countries already cooperate closely with emphasis on Nordic and West Nordic collaboration and have a good working relationship in the Arctic Council. In addition to what is recognized in the report, I would like to mention results from the first survey on foreign relations that was done in Greenland, where 90% of Greenlanders supported increased cooperation with Iceland over any other country. I am confident that the interest is not less on the part of Icelanders. In May this year, the Parliament of Iceland, Althingi, approved unanimously a parliamentary resolution on increased cooperation between Greenland and Iceland. It asked the government to follow up on the proposal put forward by the Greenland Committee. Following the report and the parliamentary resolution in late September, I and my colleague from Greenland signed a joint declaration on increased cooperation between the two countries. In the declaration, we recognize the role of Greenland and Iceland in connection with climate change in the Arctic, with the Greenland report as a solid foundation for new and further areas of cooperation. The joint declaration is not only a declaration of a greater partnership between the two countries, but also a sign of a deeper bond between the countries in the West Nordic region. The next step is to initiate a joint feasibility study on bilateral talks on comprehensive cooperation arrangement, including free trade, 
in order to identify areas of deeper cooperation between Greenland and Iceland. And finally, I would like to emphasize the importance of Greenland and Iceland working closely together on addressing the challenges that climate change brings in the Arctic. We have common interest in this region and both countries, uh, and both countries a significant role to play. There are exciting times ahead in the bilateral relations of Iceland and Greenland with multiple possibilities of cooperation making the bonds between the two countries even stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And we will now hear former Minister Össur Skarpiansson, who will give us a brief introduction of the report. Össur, if you please. Ladies and gentlemen, how can you give a brief report of a report that is 270 pages in English? In any way, I'm very pleased to be with you here again, and I'm happy to see that we don't, like, we, we don't even allow a global pandemic to prevent us from meeting together. And it's so good to be here and, and meet all the old friends that we have made here in the years past. I also have to express my gratitude to the minister, who probably is a much better minister than I ever was, because even though I was a famous Greenland and Arctic buff, he really exceeds me as a Greenland enthusiast. And it was really music to my ears to hear him talk about the way forward, and I have to say that I have been enthralled by the way he has started to implement the proposals uh, <laughs> that are included in this report. Now, in short, the report is really divided into three parts. The first is a detailed analysis of the geopolitical development in the Arctic, and it isn't possible to frame the report without going through some details into how this has uh, pro proceeded. The second part is a deep dive into the fundamentals of Greenland today, and that's not least for the benefit of the Icelandic administration that will have to implement the proposals. And the third part, which really is impossible to explain to you, contains 99 proposals from diverse fields on how we would like to see the um, cooperation of Iceland and Greenland strengthened. Well, as you can see from this slide, at the beginning of the 21st century, the geopolitical change that we have experienced in the Arctic for the last 10, 15, 20 years was signaled by the sudden departure of the U.S. from the Arctic region. In Iceland, we witnessed this when the U.S. unilaterally withdrew from the American base in Keflavik and didn't even want to stay with a limited force in the so-called security zone. And this was done in the absolute opposition to the government and at least half of the opposition at the time. And at the same time, the U.S. also scaled down activities in Greenland, for example, even in the Thule, Thule Air Base, despite the fact that the base really is the first and most vital link in the frontline defense of the U.S. and NATO. Now, in geopolitics, however, just as in nature, you never have empty spaces. When the U.S. left, a confident rising China emerged on the horizon as the new and quite interesting player in the Arctic. And just to add some spice to the geopolitical mix in the Arctic, Russia also uh, used the sudden calm in the Arctic to, to build or rebuild six new bases of the 6,000 kilometers long Siberian coast and explained it by saying, understandably, but because the natural defense lines were melting literally away with the ice on the Arctic oceans, it had to take precautions for the future. And just to put it quite simply, the emergence of 
China was quite welcome to the West Nordic countries and in a surprisingly short spate of time, quite strong economic ties were forged with China. When Washington at last had a fresh look at the Arctic 2018 to 2019, the heavyweights in DC faced a totally changed Arctic. Iceland had become the first European nation to make a free trade agreement with China. China had also made a currency swap agreement with Iceland, which the US had declined to do in 2008. In Greenland, the powers that be, the politicians, they had defined or described China as a preferred partner. And President Kim Kielsen, he had actually visited China in 2017 with three ministers, and he did not come empty-handed back Today, China has four major mining concessions in, in Greenland. And also, it's interesting to see that China has become the greatest single trade country with Greenland, buying 13 times more of fish products from Greenland than the US does today. And if you look further afield to the Faroes as well, I mean, we see that the Faroes, just like the Greenland like the Greenlanders, they now have established consulates in Beijing. And if we dive a little bit deeper into European politics, to add to all this, Norway, that also can be defined as a West Nordic country, was in, on, in the last throes of finishing a free trade agreement with China and in North Norway. There were strong politicians that had very high ideas about huge infrastructures projects supported by Best Road. And if you we, if we look further afield in Europe at this particular time when Washington was sort of revisiting the Arctic, they also saw that in Europe elsewhere, NATO stalwarts such as Luxembourg, the financial center of Europe, and Italy, one of the founding members of NATO, they had also signed up to Belt and Road that, by the way, was also offered to Iceland and to all the West Nordic nations. So, I mean, I think this was a very rude awakening for Washington. And I, can, I think we can say that when they realized this sudden change, they turned on the spot and developed a new Arctic policy almost on the go. And uh, Iceland and Greenland, that I feel were very neglected by the US for 20 years, they suddenly became hotspots in a matter of months. In Greenland, of course, this was felt by the sudden expression of love by President Trump when he offered to buy them. In Iceland, who had not been visited for 13 years by any high-standing minister of the US, we were suddenly faced with a flurry of visits of heavyweights in the spate of six months we had five very important senators coming from Washington. We had Vice President Pence and also the Secretaries of State Mike Pompeo and Rick Perry. And this guy, he almost is achieving what I never could, which was a free trade with the US that Lisa, Senator Lisa Murkowski mentioned yesterday. So, in this con it is in this concept context that I use the concept new Arctic. And this new development in itself is a big argument for a closer cooperation between Iceland and Greenland. Because it will make both countries fitter to navigate the turbulent seas of geopolitics that most certainly lie ahead of both later in this century. Now, turning to the second part of the report, the state of Greenland, and in short, our main conclusion is that Greenland really is on plan. And of course, distinguished audience, you may quite well ask, what plan? Well, since self-rule in 2009, it can be concluded by observers from the outside, like myself and the minister, that Greenland and its successive governments have actually followed a three-pronged path to economic independence, which the Greenlanders themselves, 
at least most of them define as a precursor to real independence in the, in the, in the future. Uh, firstly, to consolidate and modernize the fisheries, source of 90% of their export. Secondly, to carve out a new economic pillar in tourism. And thirdly, to prepare for a totally new era in mining. And I have to say, having followed Greenland since 1994, they have done this splendidly. In fisheries, for example, Greenland used the boom of the last 10 years to totally modernize the fleet of ocean-going trawlers that today are second to none and are at least as good as the Icelandic and Norwegian fleet. And the Icelanders and many Nordic countries, they could go to Greenland to inspect their new fish tariff system that they have recently adopted, highly efficient and also supporting the rural areas that still are the backbone of the traditional Greenlandic culture. And they have also recently put forth very clever ideas on a new fish management system that is based number one, two, and three on sustainability. In tourism, uh, two new international airports will be ready in five years in Nuuk and Ilulisat, and the third is planned in Kakortok in the south. These airports, they will transform tourism and within a decade create uh, new important pillars for the economy. Well, I'm not going to dwell very much into mining due to time constraints, but in Greenland it is quite clear that mining will be a great source of wealth in the future. They have all mineable m m minerals in high concentration and in high quantities. So let's just go to one due to time. Let's look at the, um, the, um, the rare earth metals. It's only this century that they have actually, uh, people have realized that the REMS, they are essential for several disruptive innovations, including global energy transformation and, and also vital for some armaments industries. And con consequently, the REMS are defined as strategic by the EU and the US and as critical by China. But this matters in the world of geopolitics and ex escalating trade conflicts between China and the US. The US doesn't produce, ne does produce next to nothing of the realms. On the contrary, China really has great superiority producing 78 to 100 percent of some of the uh, vital rare earth minerals. Greenland becomes very exciting in this respect because it harbors 25% of the global reserves and literally has mountains of rams. And this is one of the reasons that Greenland is a geopolitical hotspot today, as Senator Murkowski more or less said yesterday. Now, in our deep dive into Greenland social fabric, it was also interesting to see because as we all know, Greenland has, its, has had its shares of social ills. But when we looked at the present state of Greenland, all social indices are on the right track. Unemploy unemployment is down, crime is down, suicides are down. And interestingly, look at this slide. This shows the great decline of alcohol consumption in Greenland and pre-COVID, they were very close to Iceland post-COVID with new figures that I've seen. The Greenlanders consume less alcohol than the Danes and the Icelanders. So this really matters that things are socially going in the right direction. Now, our mandate was also to make proposals on how to strengthen cooperation between Iceland and Greenland in all fields. And I will see you, show you now the mother of all slides. 90 proposals, not very sexy, very unreadable, but this impresses upon you the wide reach of our proposals. And I could go through this one by point by point, but I'm not going to do it. But just lastly, as examples of diversity, I wholeheartedly agree with the minister. One of the things that I would so be so happy to see happen is a free trade agreement. We agree on free trade, if nothing else. Secondly, totally different proposal, 
Greenland-speaking nurses for emergency cases. Iceland serves the East Coast, and we get quite a few premature babies that need to go into intensive cares. They come with their young mothers, and there's a lot of linguistical difficulties. Just by hiring one or two Greenlandic-speaking nurses to each of those two hospitals that receive them would make, make the world of difference. Now, yesterday, we heard the Greenland minister talk about Greenland's goal to achieve 90% renewable energy in 2030. And they've just accepted the proposal in Parliament. But Greenland has its hands and finances tied up right now in the greatest project in Greenlandic history, the three international airports. It so happens that in Iceland that we have actually, in the past, built four of the five hydropower plants in Greenland. It also is such that the Icelandic states owns a company that co-finances, lead finances, and constructs hydropower plants, and has done so in 15 countries. I think we can join hands on this project it would speed up Greenland's progress to 90% renewable energy and would also serve to protect the Arctic environment. 270 pages in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. As we uh, saw from uh, Usher's graph there, uh, Alcohol consumption in Iceland rose significantly in uh, 2013, which was the same year that we started the Ar Arctic Circle uh, <laughs> Assembly. So maybe uh, the, the uh, discussion of a party is not so far-fetched after all. But uh, thank you, Asher, for, for your uh, explanation. The, uh, the mandate for the Greenland Committee was first and foremost to make recommendations on how to increase cooperation with our closest neighbor, Greenland. And on this note, I am pleased to introduce our, introduce our final speaker, Tove Söndal Gant, the head of the Greenlandic representation in, in Greenland. Tove, if you please. In Reykjavik. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Peter, and uh, dear Minister Gudlaugur Tor Torderson, and Chair and uh, author of this uh, almost 300 pages long report, Ushur Skarphedinson, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, sorry, it should have been the other way around, excellencies before ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful for this opportunity to engage with you on the discussion of this important uh, and impressive report, uh, Greenland and Iceland in the New uh, Arctic. As Peter Askerson said, uh, it fall on me to replace Miningwa, so uh, I hope that I will not do him injustice. Once again, thank you very much for, for this very uh, foresighted initiative, Minister, uh, of, of uh, initiating this report, and also for the Greenland Committee to put it together, uh, a report that completely focuses on the Iceland-Greenland relations. With many pages and many, many recommendations, 100, almost 100, for areas of enhanced cooperation. It really stands out as a testament to the will of the Icelandic government and its people to strengthen the bonds between our two countries. I can assure you that our government reciprocate this wish for closer cooperation. And as you all probably also know, closer cooperation with Iceland was on the top of the list in a public survey that was conducted in Greenland in little less than a year ago. With the signing of the joint declaration that the minister also mentioned that was signed between Minister Gudlaugur 
and the then Minister for Foreign Affairs, Pelle Robert, on September 23, we have embarked on a new path for further strengthening our already close cooperation. With a joint declaration, we have establish an institutionalized platform of cooperation where we can explore new cooperation areas as well as strengthening the already existing ones. We also believe that the Joint Declaration provides an appropriate framework for taking forward the many recommendations of what I will now call the New Futures Report. Since the report came out, and in particular, since our current government, the government of Mr. Borov Il took office, we have spent considerable time and energy in digesting report, both at the level of officials of many different departments of the government, but also at the political level. Our considerations on the report and its many recommendations are ongoing. Eventually, we hope to finalize and get the endorsement of the government on the analysis of the interest and the possibilities associated with the recommendations of the report in the next coming months. This way, we will come well prepared to the meetings with our Icelandic colleagues. I know this sounds terribly bureaucratic, so maybe I should go down and talk about what is uh, readily implementable. Even though we can work on the report and the, the, the recommendations, I would just point to a few areas that are immediately implementable or where we can start implementation or where implementation can be started. These are first and foremost the recommendations pertaining to independent institutions and companies, particularly companies of the private sector, that can actually start working without the endorsement of the central government. And that goes both for the Icelandic government and the Greenlandic government. One such example is when it comes to the development of long distance learning. There is already an ongoing cooperation between Elisabeth Lusafik and the University of Akureyri. Uh, and these are activities that just need to start up again after COVID. Should I worry much? It's blinking. <laughs> the lights are blinking. Okay. Um, and then there's also the recommendations pertaining to the tourism sector. Here, the already existing cooperation in the uh, West Nordic Cooperation provides a framework where both the national tourism boards and the tour operators have ample space to develop their cooperation further. And, these, and last but not least, there are the activities of civil society organizations. We are so fortunate here in Iceland and in Greenland that our citizens can move freely between our two countries, thanks to various treaties of the Nordic countries. For formal governmental agreements to be dynamic and robust, they need to be underpinned by vibrant people-to-people -people contacts. In short, we simply also need to get to know each other better and all governments can do is create the enabling uh, environment. So these are our initial remarks, and I do look forward to the discussion that we are going to have, and, uh, and of course, then the discussions that we have today will also feed into our considerations of the report. So, as we say in Southern Greenland, thank you. Thank you very much, Tove. We have almost run out of time, but I, I, think, I think we have about two minutes left for at least one question that I will pose myself. And the question is to all of you, how do you see the way forward for the two countries to develop their cooperation? And I ask you to uh, keep your answers short and concise. Minister, would you 
Would you start, please? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you both for your speeches, and I'm especially grateful for uh, how uh, the Greenland government, how they have responded, and everything that uh, Usher told us to do have been done so far. I've learned from experience it's best to just do what he tells me to do, otherwise I'm, I'm in trouble. It's much better that he speaks nicely to, of me here than, uh, well, <laughs> enough of that. But in, in all seriousness, this is a base for uh, cooperation, and uh, we need to uh, agree on things uh, so it will be fulfilled. And uh, we have now these bases. The, I, I recommend that you read the report. I know it uh, sounds a little bit long, but it, it isn't. It's well written and very knowledgeable. But the most important thing, as you mentioned, if we're going to have a stronger ties, it is people to people. So the more uh, of our people, especially young people, of course all ages, especially young people, get to know each other, uh, establish contacts, that is something that uh, will uh, be the way, way forward. And uh, I, I have to admit, I am very uh, enthusiastic when it comes to uh, free trade, because trade is much more than only uh, changing uh, money for services or good. It's connecting people. And uh, so I hope that we will see most of these uh, uh, recommendations uh, will be fulfilled, but I am especially looking uh, to, uh, to trade. But most importantly, it's not me to decide, it's uh, for uh, us together to decide what we're going to do. Oh, sir, if you please. Well, the minister wasn't always so respectful to me when I was foreign minister and he was a rebellious leader of, a young rebellious leader of the opposition. <laughs> But, but he is like good wine, he matches well with age. <laughs> but at this point in time, he will be surprised, but you know, I am a free trade enthusiast, and I think we should start by implementing easy things. The Greenlanders have always been very wary of international trade agreements, but they'll come to the state that I, I predict that in the next decade they will make many free trade agreements. And it is significant if the first agreement they make is with Iceland. Uh, free trade uh, symbolizes friendship and the will to close, have close exchanges between nations. So I would say to the minister and to Tove, you can do this, doesn't take much time, you've gone through it before in the Hoyvik uh, agreement, which the Greenlanders choose to abstain from. All the Extras, all the sizes are known, so do it, Mr. Minister, do it, and continue to be respectful to your predecessors. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Tove, would you? Yeah, I think I will answer very briefly in the interest of time. I think, as I also alluded to in my, uh, in my speech, is that the, the framework has already been set with the signing of the joint declaration. And it is in this context that we will also look at the recommendations of the report. And also, as already foreseen by the joint declaration, we will also discuss uh, issues in, in the context of a feasibility study uh, uh, on a more comprehensive cooperation uh, agreement, including trade. So, um, so we have already set the framework and set the stage. Huh? Thank you. And with that, I think uh, we, we can conclude our session here today. And I thank the panelists and the audience for their, for their presence here this afternoon. And thank you very much.